You may think global warming would be good for colder places like Canada. A new report from the government of Canada warns against that myth. The country has already warmed about twice the world average and will continue to heat up faster than the rest of the planet during this century and beyond. Scientists project more flooding, more wildfires, extreme heat events, strange winters, and damage to the seas surrounding Canada's vast coastline. Here to explain is one of Canada's top climate scientists, Dr. Nathan Gillette, received his Ph.D. in atmospheric physics from the University of Oxford. He is a coordinating lead author of the chapter on human influence on climate in the upcoming IPCC 6th assessment report. Nathan leads research into climate impacts for the Canadian government. From Victoria, British Columbia, Dr. Nathan Gillett, welcome to Radio EcoShock. We know the Arctic is wildly warmer than it was for our ancestors. Is Arctic heating the real reason Canada is warming about twice as fast as the global average? Or is populous southern Canada also heating up? Well, both southern Canada and northern Canada are warming up more than the global average. The intensification of the warmest is biggest in the north, where there's a bigger amplification from melting ice and snow. But even the south of Canada is also warming faster than the global average. Well, last year, as you know, here in the interior of British Columbia, we had damaging spring floods followed by province-wide wildfire emergency. What should people expect in western Canada during the next decade or two due to increasing greenhouse gases? The clearest signal is further warming, and that will be reflected in more heat waves, more hot extremes. And as concluded in the report, that will contribute, further contribute to an increase in wildfire risk. Uh, we can also expect to see an overall increase in rainfall. We can expect to see more extremes of rainfall as we go through the century. Here in British Columbia, there's already been a, a lot of glaciers have shown strong melting. We can expect that trend to continue. We can expect, because of melting ice and snow, the peak of river flow, river runoff, is happening earlier in the spring, and we expect that trend to continue as well. So a number of impacts uh, here in British Columbia. What about the central provinces of Ontario and Quebec, where the majority of Canadians live? For example, what are the projections for extreme heat events there? Well, as is the case throughout Canada, we expect an increase in the number of extreme heat events. The projections are similar for Ontario and Quebec. Uh, the hottest day of the year is projected to warm by about 6 degrees Celsius under a scenario with high emissions. So that's a, a business-as-usual scenario where we continue to emit greenhouse gases. Whereas if we're able to limit greenhouse gas emissions to start reducing emissions, reduced to zero by the end of the century, then we would only expect about a 1.5 degree Celsius increase in the, the hottest day of the year. So a big difference between business as usual and a scenario where we're able to reduce emissions. And for centuries, people on the eastern maritime coast of Canada have been deeply involved with the sea and fisheries. What concerns you about the health of the seas around Canada as climate change ramps up beyond 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius? Well, we're already seeing significant change in the ocean waters off Canada's coast, as described in this report. We're seeing ocean acidification. The waters are becoming more acidic, which is a problem for, for shellfish. We're seeing decreases in oxygen levels in the subsurface ocean. And we're also seeing a sea level rise that's largest in uh, Atlantic Canada and also in uh, the south of British Columbia. So there's a number of changes that are happening in the oceans around Canada that we, we expect to continue and intensify, especially above 1.5 or 2 degrees. And these will have impacts for a number of sectors, ecosystems in oceans. And unlike the United States, the majority of Canadians do not really live near the coast. So are rising seas still an issue for the country? I, I should have said at the beginning that I'm actually, my work is on the science of climate change more than the impacts of climate change. So the impacts of rising seas in Canada are a bit outside my area of expertise. Nonetheless, there are areas of Canada that are affected by sea level rise or that could, will be affected by sea level rise. One area is the Fraser Delta uh, here in British Columbia, also parts of Nova Scotia on the East Coast are particularly susceptible, but absolutely sea level rise is an issue for Canada. Nathan, what sort of climate science do you specialize in? 
My area of specialty is in uh, analysis of the causes of climate change, which we can do by comparing observations of climate change with climate model simulations to understand uh, the causes of observed changes that we're seeing in different areas of the climate system. And does Canada run full-blown climate models, as many other countries do? Absolutely, yes. I work here in Victoria at uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada's Canadian Centre for Climate Modelling and Analysis. Uh, We develop one of the world-leading climate models, which is used to support the IPCC assessments on climate change. The rest of the world tends to think about Canada and cold winter in the same sentence. What has already changed in the Canadian winter and where could it go for our grandchildren? Well, we've already observed warming in Canada, which is largest in winter, uh, about 3.3 degrees over the last 70 years, averaged over Canada. And looking to the future, the projected warming is largest in winter. Uh, So we expect the strongest warming in winter, and especially in the north. As well as a strong warming, we expect a shorter snow season, so a shorter period with snow on the ground. That's already been observed. We expect that trend to continue. And we expect a larger fraction of precipitation to fall as rain rather than as snow. Why does the new report from Environment Canada suggest that the warming and the impacts are, quote, effectively irreversible? The irreversibility of climate change is a conclusion that uh, that was brought out strongly in the last assessment report of the IPCC on uh, climate change. Carbon dioxide that's emitted by humans into the atmosphere is only removed very slowly from the atmosphere and has a lifetime in the atmosphere of centuries to millennia. And the climate system response to that carbon dioxide is even slower. We've done simulations with our climate model of what happens if we stop emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And it turns out that the average global average temperature stays almost constant uh, for centuries. Other work shows that extending to millennia. So past emissions have caused warming that is effectively irreversible on human timescales. Many of my listeners in quite a few countries are worried that when the Canadian permafrost thaws in earnest, carbon dioxide, and especially methane, could overtake human emissions, heating the whole world even more. Has this thawing started, and what do your models show? Increases in permafrost temperature have already been observed in Canada. This is discussed in this report. And as you say, feedbacks from melting permafrost are expected to increase future warming, though there's a lot of uncertainty in the size of the effect. The last assessment report of the IPCC assessed that emissions from melting permafrost would be between 50 and 250 gigatons, that's billions of tons of of carbon by 2100. So that's a significant amount of extra emissions. It's still much less than the direct human emissions, but it is a significant feedback on climate change. Uh, We're working to include permafrost feedbacks in our model. That's a, a, a topic that we're working on at the moment. Previous studies, including from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, say precipitation will increase over Canada, even as the subtropics dry out on an epic scale. Nathan, talk to us about your expectations for precipitation here. In general, precipitation is projected to increase over Canada in the annual mean. So the largest increase are projected in the north and in winter. Even in the annual average over Canada, uh, there's a projected increase of about 25% under a high emission scenario. So that's a big, uh, so that's a quarter more precipitation than we currently get uh, by the end of the century. As for temperature, those increases are much more moderate under a, a low emission scenario where we're able to reduce our emissions. Extremes of precipitation, the most intense rainfall, are also expected to increase by a similar amount. So that could have impacts on flooding, for example, flooding in urban areas, um, that we were projecting an increased risk of flooding in er urban areas going forward. Even so, the new report, Canada in a Changing Climate, warns parts of the country could experience shortages of fresh water. Now, as an older Canadian growing up with so many lakes and rivers, that seems hard for me to believe. How could some Canadians face water shortages despite annual precipitation going up? Well, the annual average precipitation is projected to go up, but in the south of Canada, especially under a high emission scenario, by the end of the century, 
there is a projected drying in summer. So overall, an increase in precipitation, but some regions in summer are projected to have decreases in precipitation. At the same time, water availability is, is more than just about uh, precipitation, rainfall. In many rivers in Canada are fed by melting snow and ice, and as I mentioned already, as the climate warms, uh, we're seeing glaciers melt, we're seeing earlier spring snow melt, and so the peak of flow is happening earlier, and the, uh, the summer flow is projected to decrease, and that's, a, that's driven by warming. So the summer flows in rivers in Canada in general is projected to decrease. So that could have implications for uh, people that depend on those summer flows, for example, for, for irrigation or for other uses. So it's a complicated picture, but yes, some areas of Canada are expected to see uh, decreases in water availability going forward. When does Environment and Climate Change Canada project sea ice could disappear in the Arctic at the peak melt point, other than, say, a few bits around the Canadian Arctic archipelago? That is, at our current rate of emissions, when could we expect to have an open Arctic Ocean in late summer? So most Canadian sea ice regions are projected to be sea ice free for at least part of the summer by 2050. Middle of the century, not that far from where we are now, 30 years from now. That's right. Do we know for sure whether the great boreal forest that runs right across Canada's north is now a carbon sink or a carbon source? So recent estimates based both on uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide measurements and also estimates from models uh, show that in general, uh, the boreal area of North America is currently a, a sink of carbon dioxide, uh, and that's happening for two main reasons. Um, one is that as the carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, plants tend to absorb more carbon dioxide. And the second contributing reason is that as the climate warms, vegetation can move north, bushes and trees can move north, and as uh, that additional vegetation grows, it, it can absorb uh, additional carbon dioxide. So currently, the estimates are that the uh, boreal region is a uh, sink of carbon dioxide. That could change in the future, depending on what happens to a uh, permafrost. Canada is also a major food producer and exporter, but we can't really move crops like wheat too far north into the poor soils of the Canadian Shield. What are some climate concerns in your report for Canadian agriculture? So this report is focused on physical uh, changes in the physical climate system in Canada. There will be follow-up reports uh, looking at impacts of climate change in Canada, which will uh, look at these questions in more detail. Uh, that said, based on information from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, some key concerns for agriculture in Canada are, well, so I guess one thing is to say is that there will be some positive effects of climate change in terms of longer growing seasons. But the main challenges are expected to come from decreased water availability. As I mentioned, summer river flows projected to decrease and also drying and more evaporation is projected in the south of Canada by the end of the century under high emissions. And another area of concern is additional heat stress on livestock uh, from a warmer temperature, more uh, heat waves. What targets have to happen with global greenhouse emissions, like for all countries, for Canada to avoid the worst-case scenarios outlined in your new report? The first thing to say is that future climate change depends on future emissions, and the amount of warming depends pretty closely on the total amount of, of greenhouse gases, total amount of carbon dioxide that is emitted. So any reduction in future emissions will contribute to reducing climate change. In terms of the scenarios that we looked at in this report, uh, the scenario with decreasing emissions, which was approximately consistent with the Paris climate goal of limiting global warming to two degrees, has global emissions of greenhouse gases beginning to decline in the near future and uh, being reduced to uh, zero uh, shortly after the middle of this century. So reaching that Paris goal of uh, less than two degrees does require soon and uh, rapid action to reduce global emissions of greenhouse gases. And you're working on this, so when is the sixth assessment report from the IPCC due out, and what are Canadian scientists contributing to it? That report is due to be published in 2021. So I, I'm working on the Working Group 1 report, which is concerned with the physical climate change, um, so I can give you information on that. Uh, there's eight Canadian author, or eight 
people that based in Canada that are either authors or review editors of the report. So there's a pretty strong uh, Canadian contribution to the preparation of this report. And what is Working Group 1 looking at? So Working Group 1 looks at changes in the physical climate system. So what climate change has been observed, um, what changes are expected in the future. Um, Working Group 2 looks at the impacts of climate change, so how climate change is affecting ecosystems, human health, uh, this kind of question. And then Working Group 3 looks at responses, possible responses to climate change. How can we mitigate climate change? How can we adapt to climate change? Dr. Nathan Gillett is a senior research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada's Climate Change Research Division. We've been talking about a new report, Canada in a Changing Climate, Advancing Our Knowledge for Action. Find it on the web at changingclimate.ca. I'll put a link in my own show blog at ecoshock.org. Nathan, thank you for sharing your valuable time with us. Thank you very much.